Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified and answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 11th of January 2023. Let's now begin the discussion. So the first article that we have taken has appeared on page number 2 which happens to be the page for the regional news and this might not be visible to everyone across the country but this topic is very important. The heading of the article is excluding civil servants from a state's reign negates autonomy. So the constitution bench led by Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud on Tuesday asked Arvind Kejriwal government whether civil servants posted in the national capital in relation to public order, police and land will come outside the purview of the executive power of Delhi government. And this is a very very subtle legal point because if you look at it Delhi happens to be a union territory. Union territories are totally controlled by the central government. But Delhi is a little bit more special in that sense because it's a union territory with a legislative assembly with elected council of ministers headed by a chief minister. So it's not like Chandigarh. It's not like uh, Andaman and Nicobar and Lakshadweep. It's different. And so in order to understand why there is always a tussle between the Delhi government and the central government, we have to understand first the constitutional development of Delhi, constitutional provision and what are the issues in it. Also, there has been an amendment to the NCT of Delhi Act in 2021 that also has to be understand as to why the central government brought that amendment. Now, if you're wondering how is it related to your syllabus, in, in fact, before showing you the syllabus, let's go through this 2018 Mains GS Paper 2 question. Whether the Supreme Court judgment of July 2018 can settle the political tussle between the Lieutenant Governor and the elected government of Delhi examine. And if you look at the syllabus of GS Paper 2, functions and responsibilities of the union and the states, issues and challenges pertaining to federal structure and devolution of power and finances up to local levels and challenges therein is a part of your syllabus and how the power is distributed between the center and the state government of delhi is of course a matter of concern for both union and the state and so we shall have all this discussion in the ensuing explanation let's now begin the discussion okay so delhi as we know it today has not existed like this in terms of administration since the time of independence. Delhi became a part C state, you know those categorizations of A, B, C and D in 1950. Then in 1951, for a very brief period of time, legislative assembly was created with an elected CM. But that lasted only for five years because all of us know that in 1956, States Reorganization Act reorganized the whole country and in that process, Delhi became a union territory to be administered by an administrator who was appointed by president. And so, Delhi began to be directly administered by the central government and this continued for a very long time. Although some form of representative local government was provided to Delhi in 1966 in form of Delhi Administration Act 1966, which provided limited representative government through creation of metropolitan councils that has continued even now. And so, finally the current arrangement started in 1991 when 69th Constitutional Amendment Act, which was based upon Balakrishnan Committee report, again created representative form of government in Delhi through creation of Legislative Assembly and Council of Ministers to aid and advise the Lieutenant Governor. So what is the constitutional scheme of Delhi? We know that Various parts of the constitution of India deal with various aspects of administration of the country. So for example, part 5 deals with the union, part 6 deals with the states, deals with the union territories and as you can see, article 239AA, article 239AA carries special provisions with respect to Delhi. And so, there should not be any particular doubt in your mind whether Delhi is a state or a union territory. Delhi is a union territory with legislative assembly and with elected council of members to aid and advise the lieutenant governor just like Pondicherry. Whereas all other union territories do not have an elected council of minister headed by a chief minister and they do not have a legislative assembly as well. So what are the provisions of article 239AA which was inserted through 69th constitutional amendment? So first and foremost, it granted special status to Delhi. Why was a special? Why is it called a special status? 
it is called a special status because despite being a union territory which is supposed to be directly administered by the central government it was provided with legislative assembly and council of ministers and just like legislative assemblies of all the states are empowered to make laws on state list matters and concurrent list matters even the legislative assembly of delhi was empowered to do so except on three important matters public order police and land and this has been the root cause of the problem between the delhi government and the central government because whenever a party comes to power in delhi which is different from the party commanding the power in the central government it always leads to conflict because public order police and land are one of the key and important aspects of governance if a state government does not have police under their hands or the land under their hands they will not be able to fulfill a lot of needs of the local residents and that is where when the confrontation first emerged when the aam aadmi party came into power in delhi they went to the supreme court and supreme court decided the matter and supreme court came up with its judgment of government of nctd versus union of india 2018 in which the supreme court first and foremost ruled that since delhi was a union territory all powers lay ultimately with the central government and not the elected government of delhi and so it was a big boost to the claim by the central government because after all this is what central government had been saying past many years but there were other aspects to the judgment as well which is very relevant for us to be understood so apart from reinstating the claim of the central government supreme court observed many things and it issued a form of principles in order to ensure the better governance and efficient administration of the delhi it said that delhi government has powers in all matters except public order police and land and so the lg would be or the lieutenant governor of delhi would be bound by the aid and advice of council of ministers just like all other governors except on those matters which are mentioned in the public order police and land so if the government comes up with some initiative in health and education the lieutenant governor should have no problem and should usually approve that initiative but if an initiative or a law deals with police or land legislative assembly and council of ministers cannot do anything about it but apart from this the only exception to this rule is a provision mentioned in article 239 aa which allowed the lg to refer to the president any issue on which there was a difference of opinion with the council of ministers in such a case the lg would be bound by the president's decision now this difference of opinion can be related to police public order and land but they can be with respect to various matters and this is where the main problem starts since the lieutenant governor can have issues in any of the fields under the matters of legislative assembly and council of ministers he or she can refer any matter literally to president which then ultimately will be decided by central government and so this created a big problem and so on all the matters where lg and council of ministers have differing opinion neither lg nor cum can decide on their own but that matter has to be referred to president and so you can see that this particular judgment did not do anything exceptional to help solve this complicated situation and that is why the government of india came up with amendment to the gnctd act 1991 which is known as amendment act 2021 and government gave two very specific reasons to come up with these amendments the government said that there was no structural mechanism within the 1991 act to ensure time bound implementation of the rules of the act and also the law gives no clarity about what proposal or matters need to be taken up with the lg before issuing an order and so there was a time that these two things needed to be clarified and so this particular amendment brought two important changes to the act first the amendment says that the term government in any law made by the legislative assembly shall mean lg whereas if you remember the 2018 judgment of the supreme court it said the lg would be bound by the aid and advice of council of ministers in matters that were not directly under the control of lg and the second important change which the amendment has made is that lg's opinion shall be obtained before the government takes any executive action based on decision taken by the cabinet or any individual minister so now the lg's opinion has been made must even before the decision has been arrived at and all the references to the government would mean references to the lg so indirectly all the powers are now being transferred to the lieutenant governor of delhi and that is why the delhi government has again challenged these amendment in the supreme court 
Apart from this, there are two other important aspects as well. For example, under the amended act, legislative assembly shall not make rule to enable itself to its committees to consider the matters of day-to-day -day administration of the capital or conduct inquiries in relation to the administrative decisions. Any of the rule made in contravention of this provision shall be void. So the legislative assembly cannot make any rules and that is a big problem when it comes to the normal functioning of the legislative assembly. And finally, the LG will not assent to and pass on to the president for consideration of any bill which incidentally covers any of the matter which falls outside the purview of the power conferred on the legislative assembly. Which means that if LG feels that any of the law any of the upcoming draft bill has potential to impact either public order or police or land directly or indirectly, he will not give assent to that particular bill. This has now been explicitly mentioned. So now this has created a lot of problems and there are a lot of issues with the act. First and foremost, centralization of the power in the central government. The act favors vesting real powers in the nominated LG rather than in the representative government then it undermines the representative form of the government. LG, who will now be the government, is under no obligation to implement any law passed by the assembly or carry out the directions of the house as he or she is not responsible to the assembly. Then it also goes against the much touted cooperative federalism principle of the central government. At the same time, it is also going to create a lot of roadblocks for the Delhi government. The elected government of Delhi will have to wait endlessly for the LG's opinion without being able to execute their decision. And hence there are high chances that the government could become dysfunctional in Delhi. And apart from all the facts, the act has been passed in haste without being referred to select committees and without proper debate. So the next article that we have taken has appeared on page number 10. DSE gives not to purchase indigenous defense systems. Acceptance of necessity given for three capital acquisition proposals amounting to around 4,276 crores. This includes uh, helicopter launch NARC missiles and BrahMos cruise missile launchers for ships. So the Defence Acquisition Council headed by Defence Minister Rajnath Singh. Also an important point from the perspective of prelims examination is that the Defence Acquisition Council is headed by the Defence Minister has accorded acceptance of necessity for three capital acquisition which means Three different forms of arms and ammunitions have been approved to be acquired by the defense forces. These include helicopter launched NAG, anti tank guided ATGM, very short range air defense or Veshaurad, Brahmos cruise missile launchers, and fire control systems. Now, if you notice one thing, is the fact in the heading is all these systems are indigenous defense systems, they are made in India. So we are going to begin the analysis by first understanding the mapping of this particular topic with the UPSC syllabus. And as you can see, achievement of Indians in science and technology, indigenization of technology and developing new technology is a part of your syllabus in GS paper 3. And so in this regard, we are going to discuss four key things. Why there is a need for indigenization? What are the issues with indigenization? What are the steps that have been taken for indigenization and the draft defense and export promotion policy which was released just last year. And so let us now begin the discussion by first understanding why is there a need to indigenize and this goes for any technology, this goes for any sector but specifically for the defense sector. Why indigenization of defense technology is absolutely important for maintaining India's integrity and sovereignty. Starting with India's second largest arm importer. If you take all the countries which import arms and ammunition from foreign countries, India stands second in the list. So very valuable foreign exchange reserve has to be divested, has to be spent while acquiring these arms and ammunition. Apart from running down our foreign exchange reserve, it also impacts our trade deficit. So by possessing a sound defense sector indigenously, India can not only reduce its dependence on foreign imports, but also it gives us an opportunity to convert this trade deficit into surplus. So this is just economy, but it also has a strategic point of view. It also has a security implications. 
by not possessing domestic capability to produce arms and ammunition makes india perpetually dependent on other countries because once you start importing a lot of arms and ammunitions from foreign countries first it does not gives you an opportunity to develop your own domestic base and second you are perpetually dependent for their parts for their servicing for their maintenance on the source countries and this subjects india to a lot of strategic constraints so for example if you have imported significant amount of fighter jets from france it is mandatory for india now to maintain cordial relation with france because if tomorrow france says that we are not going to service our rafale jets then india cannot do anything because there is no other supplier of the parts of this very specific and specialized fighter jet apart from that having a domestic capability to develop such a high tech machinery is going to employ a lot of people not just in primary but secondary at tertiary level as well and it will definitely lead to overall industrial growth because you need to understand a concept of propulsive industry and defense sector is a propulsive industry so it's just not like a very minor industry which is going to serve its own purpose once a defense project is established a lot of other industries are needed to support or to cater to the defense industry and hence it has a multiplier effect so propulsive industries are those which lead to generation of subsidiary industries along or around their areas so you can understand that having a sound domestic base of manufacturing in defense technology is not only important for economic purposes but also very very crucial for india's strategic independence or autonomy because then indian foreign policies would not be contingent upon the policies of major developed countries so for example right now west is in fight or in war with russia not directly but indirectly now india imports arms not just from russia but also from us and france which is stopping india from taking any sides in this particular conflict for example in last 3 to 4 years india is having a very hard time in convincing usa that import of s400 missile defense systems from russia should not be put under sanction list of america so these kinds of problems shall not arise if india has defense domestic production or sound domestic defense manufacturing capabilities so before going forward let us now first understand what are the pillars of defense capabilities so you need to understand that there are four stakeholders to defense manufacturing ecosystem the first one is the end user which is the overall purpose of designing a defense equipment which are armed forces they are the people who are ultimately going to use these weapons then next comes designing which is the conceptualization of the weapons for which we have drdo then after an equipment has been designed or conceptualized that design once approved is handed over to the manufacturer or the makers which are basically either public sector undertaking companies or the private sector undertakings and then last but not the least pillar of defense capability is academia where all the front line research goes on if we talk about the four components the last one which is academia is the weakest link in our country because the human resource capabilities in developed countries which deal with the cutting edge research is generally located in top institutions like harvard stanford mit caltech whereas in our country the cutting edge research is right now going on in drdo and isro and not in our universities and institutes so what are the challenges which india's defense manufacturing capabilities are facing the first and foremost is the massive delays in not just the designing and manufacturing but also in the acquisition processes and the main reason behind that is the functioning of armed forces which are the users the designers which is drdo and the makers which are psus work in silos there is hardly any interaction or collaboration so to say in between or among these four pillars and because of this when a need is felt by an armed forces or component of armed forces about a new equipment or a weapon or a technology it is usually 5 to 10 years of delay when that need is communicated to drdo then drdo comes up with a design which is then delayed by almost 5 to 7 years in communication to psus and so you can see once a need is felt at the ground level in border areas 
it is already 20 25 years time when the weapon is made by the public sector undertakings when we talk about delay in the designing and in the making stage we can clearly see that defense technology in india is public sector driven and so all the issues which plague public sector undertakings in all the sectors in our country also plagues the defense sector as well now because of the government policies there is still no liberalization in defense manufacturing because of which all the major players are public sector undertakings which then clearly reflects in either the final product being substandard or extremely delayed which then renders it useless for the army because by that time the government of india has already gone ahead and acquired a foreign made equipment or a weapon serving the same purpose for which the research was undertaken then comes the issue of lack of critical technology and this is mainly because of lack of funds as well as lack of requisite skills in the human resource in our country and that is mainly because of the neglected fourth pillar of our ecosystem which is academia our premier institutes in technology for example iits and nits do not have a separate stream specializing in defense technology even the funding of the government when it comes to designing of new technology is minimal then there are other issues as well for example long gestation period as all of us can easily understand that these technology require a lot of time to be actually effectual on ground and as we have discussed armed forces usually run out of patience because ultimately they are the one who are going to defend our borders and us and so they pushed the government to acquire foreign made goods which then finally scuttles the defense development program of that particular weapon in our country and then finally we have a lot of land acquisition issues just like all other fields which have led to delay in a lot of defense development projects in our country but it's not like government has not taken any initiative or step in this regard we have a department of defense production in ministry of defense taking care of production and designing of new weapons which manages and runs the ordinance factories which manufacture a lot of arms and especially the minor arms but which are mainly on the basis of technology transfer where an original patent holder of a foreign weapon leases out licenses to manufacture a particular arm to various companies across the world so it's not like a development of new technology but production based on already existing technology purchased on license from a foreign vendor then we have a lot of defense psus for example hal mdsl also recently government has started issuing licenses to the private sector players for the production of minor arms so this is mainly as far as the production is concerned what about designing and for that we already have drdo which is the prime agency responsible for designing and development of state of the art defense technology and one of the few most significant and successful technologies developed by our drdo are prithvi missile agni missile and tejas then this is not just it indian armed forces have their in house design team and the wings which parallelly run the program of designing of new weapons because ultimately they are the ones who are going to use it and so they are the most well placed agencies to understand their own needs and come up with some very rough draft or a very initial basic design which can then be communicated to drdo for further development then in 2020 government notified defense procurement procedure which came up with a lot of categories of defense equipments for example made in india built in india designed in india and depending upon the percentage of indigenization the government gives preference in the acquisition process then the government has also come up with a lot of schemes for example make in india startup india idex then recently government of india has also launched this scheme of defense corridors for example the latest one being or the only two being one in, located in tamil nadu and another one located in uttar pradesh so the draft defense procurement policy 2020 is the latest document of the government of india it is important for us to have a look at that it aims to achieve a turnover of rupees 175000 crore or 25 billion dollars including export of around 35000 crore in aerospace and defense goods and services by 2025 it intends to develop a dynamic 
robust and competitive defense industry including aerospace and naval ship building industry to cater to the needs of armed forces with quality products it also intends to reduce dependence on imports and take forward make in india initiatives through domestic design and development at the same time it aims to promote export of defense products and become a part of global defense value chains and finally it will aim to create an environment that encourages research and development rewards innovation creates indian intellectually property ownerships and promote a robust and self reliant defense industry so how does it wants or intends to achieve all of this which we have discussed in the previous slide so the draft policy clearly lists down six major areas of action for example procurement reforms support to msmes and startups optimizing resource allocation investment promotion innovation and r&d and focusing on dpsus and ordinance factory board so let us now begin with procurement reforms now we understand that procurement is completely and totally in the hands of the government and so the government has proposed to publish a negative list now what does this mean so negative list is a list of equipment and if a particular equipment finds its place in the negative list it cannot be imported but only domestically manufactured and so what government has done is that it has laid out a plan of yearly increasing negative list so for example let's say that the government notifies the negative list for 2024 and helicopter is there in 2024 which will mean that 2024 onwards helicopters cannot be imported in india it can only be manufactured in india and then acquired by the government of india this will not only boost domestic manufacturing but will also act as an assurance to domestic manufacturers who will be assured that there would be a market and government is the biggest market one can have for the production that they are going to now conduct and so if the government releases an advanced negative list the people who are interested in defense technology can look at that list and start their research and development start their designing start their production anticipating the procurement of these items from the government because now they don't have to fight or compete against the foreign vendors all they have to do is to be better than the other domestic players and the government has specifically mentioned in the draft policy that this list will progressively become longer and longer which is a great news at the same time government also realizes that defense manufacturing and production is a highly specialized and skilled job which requires a priori estimation of the development times and production lead times which is basically the minimum amount of leverage in terms of time an agency needs to be able to successfully develop a weapon or an equipment life cycle costs as well as maintenance requirements and so in order to be able to calculate all of these and integrate these into the overall cost a project management unit has been conceptualized in the draft policy which will have representation from all the services which will not only facilitate the overall procurement but will at the same time also ensure the enforcement of the contracts next comes support to msmes and startups like any other sector msmes or startups form an important part or pillar of defense manufacturing as well and in this regard the draft policy proposes two important suggestions the first is that it proposes component manufacturing by msmes immediately once this policy is notified and from the reading of the draft it makes us or leads us to believe that the government might make it mandatory for all the components production to be done under msme sector then it proposes an indigenization portal which would be quite similar to the gem portal where all the services are going to list out the demands or their needs and anyone from the private sector especially belonging to the msme sector will be eligible to contact the services their project management unit and propose their idea or the design or the manufactured products and so it is going to go a long way in addressing the delay in procurement and acquisition process then in the draft policy government has also proposed optimization of resource allocation so for example currently all the expenses on acquisition of capital is shown under one head now the government is planning to make a distinct budget head for domestic products among all the services and the government is going to make it mandatory for that particular amount to be spent only on domestic acquisition or the products which have been domestically manufactured 
Then in the draft policy, government is actively looking into promotion of investment through ease of doing business. Then in the draft policy, government also mentions of creating a narrow engine complexes, which will not only focus on manufacturing of aviation sector equipments like helicopters and jet fighter jets, but also will look into MRO capabilities, which is basically maintenance, repair and overhaul. And if you know, currently in India, there is no MRO services provided by either Boeing or Airbus. All our aircrafts have to go either to Middle East or European countries in order to get them serviced. Then what about the innovation in R&D in which India is pathetically behind? And in the draft policy, government has proposed target missions and it has specified some items only for them. The government is going to run target missions. So these are hypersonic missiles, fifth generation fighter aircraft and transport aircraft. So just like government runs very targeted schemes for let's say public distribution system for enabling people to construct their own homes through Avas Yojanas, similarly specifically targeted schemes will be run or the missions will be run to manufacture domestically these three highly advanced technologies. And in the draft policy, government specifically mentions lab to lines or concept to implementation scheme. So government is going to lay a lot of emphasis on how and why we can convert the ideas or the designs into functioning models which are effective on ground, which is the basic problem for our country. So these are the highlighting points of draft defense policy, which can be as it is asked in the mains or also in prelims examination. So the next article that we have taken has appeared on page number seven, decriminalizing homosexuality, but no same sex marriage. The article basically talks about various kinds of issues and challenges being faced by this particularly vulnerable section of our society, which is LGBTQ. L stands for lesbian, G stands for gay, B for bisexual, T for transgender and Q for cure. Now, if you look at the syllabus of GS paper two, welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population schemes mechanisms laws institutions and bodies constitution constituted for the protection and betterment of these vulnerable sections is a part of a syllabus and hence it is important for us to understand these legal spheres along with the challenges being faced by these communities particularly lgbtq and so today we shall just limit our discussion to the issues being faced by the lgbtq community let us now begin the discussion so when we talk about the issues related to LGBTQ community, the issues can be segregated into five main headings. Lack of data and basic research, which is a basic problem. Marginalization and social exclusion related to stereotype and stigma. Educational exclusion, economic deprivation, and finally, and finally the legal injustice or lack of justice to the LGBT community. So when we talk about lack of data and basic research, this is a this is a fundamental problem in dealing with most of the vulnerable sections. Because if you do not have the proper data and if you do not have research and statistics about this population belonging to LGBTQ community, how are you even going to formulate a policy? And finding empirical data on, uh, let's say, economic, health, family and other outcomes of LGBTQ people is complicated by several challenges. For example, most of the surveys related to economy or health do not include questions about sexual orientation. So if you fill up the forms, the questions are always about the gender with which a person identifies and not the orientation or the sexual preferences of that particular person. Apart from that, stigma and fear of discrimination might always reduce the willingness of LGBTQ people to correctly report their sexual orientation or gender identity on surveys. So if you combine these two factors, they ultimately lead to the lack of data and hence deter the basic research. For example, in 2011 Indian census, which marked the first time that an other category was added to the male and female options on the question about sex. And this is a very, very important information from the perspective of prelims examination. 2011 Indian census marked the first time that an other category was added to the male and female options. And in a sense, it provided a third gender category, 
बट द रिजल्ट काउंट ऑफ ट्रांसजेंडर पीपल इज थॉट बाय सम ऑब्जर्वर टू बी अनरिलेबल अ टोटल ऑफ फोर लैख नाइन्टी थाउजेंड इंडिविजुअल्स ऑफ ऑल एजेस रिपोर्टेड द अदर ऑप्शन और अबाउट जस्ट पॉइंट जीरो फोर परसेंट ऑफ द इंडियन पॉपुलेशन ऑफ अबाउंड वन पॉइंट टू बिलियन पीपल कैन यू बिलीव इट In fact many observers believe that figure to be an undercount or understatement given the unfamiliarity of the option concerns about the quality of answers coded by enumerators and the likely underreporting by transgender people worried about revealing a stigmatized status to the government are some of the factors which might have resulted into this underreporting so just 4.9 lakh people in india have come out as the transgenders which is a way way below as compared to the developed countries and so it is a challenge to frame appropriate policies for the lgbtq communities without the reliable and adequate data as we have understood because of the stigma attached to the sexual orientation the lgbtq people are relegated to the margins of society this marginalization often excludes them from accessing basic services like education like health like housing and even accessing the legal justice system and so all these are basically out of the purview of a transgender or a person belonging to lgbtq community in general This marginalization and social exclusion often reflects itself in the form of exclusion from the educational network and educational system in India also because when you come out as an LGBTQ person the harassment and violence by teachers and classmates and colleagues is very common and that treatment reduces their ability to continue with their education apart from that resources for investment in training or education by families might also be diminished for children who are gender non conforming which basically means that people who do not conform to the biological sex at birth which is either male or female they are known as people of gender non conforming then if you are excluded and marginalized from society and if you do not get enough education of course your chances of doing well economically are diminished and hence the economic deprivation there is very pervasive uh, discrimination in hiring which basically results from low skill acquisition while at the time of education and vocational training and uh, since they already have very unequal access to education uh, this results in wage gap also and final nail in the coffin is the legal injustice so you knock on the doors of judiciary and you do not get justice or in fact you are not able to knock on the doors of the justice also despite homosexuality being decriminalized in india after the section 377 was struck down let us know in the comment section which was that important judgment which led to the striking down of section 377 section 377 has been decriminalized but the laws in india still remain hostile and prejudicial towards the lgbtq community in several aspect of uh, the current debate for example about marriage so your marriage cannot be registered if the two people do not belong to the opposite sex so in india right now in order to get your marriage registered one person has to be male another person has to be biologically female apart from marriage the problems of adoption also are strongly tilted against lgbtq communities then problems of surrogacy also hinder their parenthood so you can see that in terms of legal sphere also the people belonging to lgbt community once they come out as lgbtq are not treated equal to the straight people now in this regard two important legal judgments are worth remembering first of course is the nalsa judgment of 2014 where the supreme court issued a sweeping judgment which held that transgender people should be legally recognized according to their gender identity enjoy all fundamental rights and receive special benefits in education and employment whereas in case of navteej singh johar versus union of india 2018 judgment the supreme court decriminalized uh, section 377 of ipc which basically means decriminalization of homosexuality and that the section 377 was violative of right to freedom of life privacy and equality of sexual minorities The last article for today's discussion the stalemate between Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So why is there a conflict between the two states? And it is about dividing the assets and liabilities of the two states.
सो द डिवीजन ऑफ द स्टेट और अस्ट वाइल आंध्र प्रदेश इन टू द टू स्टेट्स ऑफ तेलंगाना एंड आंध्र प्रदेश हैज ऑलरेडी हैपन बट देन ऑल द पार्टीशन लीव बिहाइंड वेरी वेरी एक्रीमोनियस लेगेसीज एंड सो दिस इज ऑल्सो वन ऑफ द परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ इंटर स्टेट डिस्प्यूट मोर नंबर ऑफ न्यू स्टेट्स यू क्रिएट मोर नंबर ऑफ डिस्प्यूट्स यू आर गोइंग टू हैव एंड दिस इज वन ऑफ द मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ दैट सो वट आर द गवर्नमेंट्स ऑफ बोथ स्टेट्स क्लेमिंग what have been the recommendations of the expert committee on asset division and will the union government intervene in the issue to settle the conflict amicably so more than 8 years after the bifurcation of erstwhile united andhra pradesh division of assets and liabilities between the two states remain elusive as the states make their own interpretation of the provisions of andhra pradesh reorganization act 2014 let us know in the comment section what is the procedure to divide a particular state especially focusing upon the provision of article 3 of the constitution of india so what are the assets over which these two states are fighting they are fighting over 91 institutions under schedule 9 of the act 142 institution under 10th schedule of the act 12 institutions which are not mentioned in the act but to be divided and hence total of 245 institutions with fixed asset of around 1.42 lakh crore are to be divided and you can understand that this is not some small meager amount of money this is huge amount of money so in order to decide these assets amicably an expert committee under the chairmanship of retired bureaucrat sheila bhide was uh, set up which gave its recommendation now andhra pradesh government wants the recommendation to be accepted as it is and claims that the telangana government is being selective in accepting the recommendations whereas the telangana government is critical of recommendations of expert committee in relation to the division of assets which are not a part of headquarter assets it claims that it is against the spirit of reorganization act now as per the officials of telangana government there is a clear definition of division of headquarter assets in section 53 of the reorganization act now this is beyond the purview of the upsc syllabus however what is under the purview of upsc syllabus is the original jurisdiction of the supreme court under article 131 because now these two states have reached the supreme court to decide the matter now if you look at article 131 it says that the sub it says that subject to the provision of this constitution the supreme court shall to the exclusion of any other court have original jurisdiction in any dispute which is between the government of india and one or more states between the government of india and any state or states on one side and one or more state on the other side and between two or more states so you can see that utilizing the provision of article 131 clause c these two states have approached supreme court to settle the division of assets as well as liabilities and this is very very important from the perspective of prelims examination 